Good morning, this is Jim Moore, and you are watching Words of Encouragement. It is February 24th, 2023, and this is episode number 605. <laughs> I almost made it without looking over at the camera. God bless you. Nice to have you here today. Hope you're having a great day. For our friends uh, over in the Willamette Valley, I guess you guys are getting a lot of snow and ice. Be careful. Be safe when you travel. And uh, for those of our friends who are over here in the south in Texas, uh, kind of off and on. It's February, and so it's kind of off and on. Hi, Linda. God bless you. And uh, so had 80, I think 80 plus degree weather yesterday and the day before, and then today it's cold and windy. So amen. It's all good. So we're going to be talking today about a number of things. As you come on, please uh, let us know that you're there so we can say hello to you. And um, yeah, some exciting things are happening in the world. I've actually kind of been talking about uh, the same thing for the last few days. Good morning, Debbie. God bless you. Cassandra, God bless you. And there's the lovely Linda, my bride. I love you. Thank you. So <clears throat> I want, I'm, I'm not trying to just keep, you know, repeating the same thing over and over, but the Holy Spirit won't let me get away from this. And I, I trust it's because we need to hear it. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't like the idea of standing before the Lord one day in regret. <laughs> Deborah saying, to, wow, that's amazing. Be careful. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about history revisited. We're going to talk about uh, He is Better Than Me, psychedelic mushrooms. Now, isn't that something? And uh, today's addicts are tomorrow's preachers. So I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, I missed what you were doing in my generation. I believe that it is important that we're aware of what God is concerned about and what his response to those concerns are. So suffice it to say that the Lord is concerned about pretty much everything. He's con everything that you're concerned about, he's concerned about. Now, here's where we're going to start honing in, so listen real close. Everything that you're concerned about, the Lord is concerned about because you're concerned about it. Now, you may have the, too much of an emphasis on it, not enough, whatever, but let's say something matters to you way more than it ought to matter. He's still concerned about it because you are, because he lives inside of you, and what concerns you concerns him. Now, there are plenty of things in the world that we're not really that concerned about. I mean, all of us have stuff we're like, you know what, I don't have time for that, whatever. Trust me, he is concerned about those things. In other words, he's concerned about what you're concerned about, but he's also concerned about a whole lot of things that you're not really concerned about. Hey, Angie, God bless you. So that's, that's the issue. The God of the universe, I'm going to say it this way today. He's better than me. Okay, that's the first part of this. He is better than me. Now, Holy Spirit, open our eyes to hear what you want to say today. In Jesus' name. He is... He loves better than you do, right? I know we all say amen to that. We know that, but we need to remember sometimes. He is more diligent than you and I are. He, I mean, there's, he has a greater sense of justice than you and I do. He is good. He is better at everything than we are. So just because something doesn't really matter too much to you and I doesn't mean he does, it doesn't matter to him a lot, okay? <clears throat> so injustices in the world, absolutely. Uh, people getting their daily food, absolutely. You know, young people that, you know, we just got word this morning that someone had uh, passed away. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints, that's the one side. And then the other side, it says he's not willing that any should perish. So he is concerned about every human soul. All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> saying that, one of the reasons I think that God wants to keep revisiting uh, some of these things as they're growing in the world is because he doesn't want you and I to dismiss them as some kind of an irrelevant thing that doesn't really apply to my life. 
And again, your life is like a garden. You can only plant so many things in it. We're in the middle of getting ready to plant a garden. You get what I'm saying? Your life, your, your mentality, what you can think on, what you can dwell on, what you can act, actually you know, do with your, the time that you've been given, that's limited. Okay, so you cannot have the same level of concern that God has about everything. But the things that he has put in your purview are, we need to be diligent about them. And so <clears throat> what's happening in our generation right now is pretty darn important. And at the very least, at the very least, we need to know about it and we need to agree with God about what he's doing. Okay, so we keep talking about what's going on in revival. We talk about what's going on in renewal. It's kind of amazing to me sometimes how we can pray and pray and go to these big rallies and everybody weep and cry and shout and whatever for these things to happen. And then when they do start to happen, we criticize and we're critiquing everything and we pick it apart instead of just saying, Lord, do it. God, you just come. And somebody says, yeah, but what about false doctrine? Can I tell you this? There will be false doctrine. Okay? The idea that there will be an outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord without false doctrine, I guarantee you, even though it's not written down in history, you go to, if you were to be transported back in time to any revival that ever happened, you would see false doctrine. You would see people doing crazy stuff, stupid stuff. You would see people that believed in it. You would see people that didn't believe in it. You would see people that worshipped the leaders of it and people that didn't. It's always going to be that way. So I'm not saying that we should, you know, just cast off deserving. Not at all. You know, if I see something demonic in, in some, some movement somewhere or some church that I'm responsible for going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise a red flag and go, wait a minute. But that doesn't discount that the Lord is in the midst, okay? Most of your cults start out by well-intended people who actually really want to love and serve God. Jim Jones, the whole, uh, you know, thing that happened in, you know, when they went to Africa and everybody uh, took their lives. He started out a pretty normal guy, okay? Uh, David Koresh, right here in Texas, in Waco, Texas, same thing. So we have this concept that when things go awry, that means the person was evil to begin with. That's just not true. Some of the greatest men and women in the Bible had great beginnings for all intents and purposes. How, what we can see is they were sincere they loved God. They wanted to serve God. They were trying to keep his, but somewhere along the line, they went astray. Now, Rick Joyner has a, um, a phrase that the Lord spoke to him when he was in a, uh, a dream or vision state. I don't remember which, but he's in the heavenly realm. And the Lord says, anyone can fall from any level at any time. Anyone, any level, any time. History, you don't have to even search hard to find out this is true historically. If you've never read God's Generals by Lars Reardon, is that it? <laughs> Absolute must reading because you need to know what God will do with a human being. But God using a human being, hi Tammy, doesn't protect them from slipping and losing it. We, the Bible says when you, now this is the Lord speaking now, not me, not somebody else. He says, God says, when you think you stand, in other words, when you think everything, you don't have to, nothing to worry about anymore because look, God is using me to heal the sick and raise the dead or whatever, or win multitudes. It says, when you think you stand, take heed, which means simply be careful. Hey, Dana, love you. All right, <clears throat> so history is revisiting itself. Absolutely. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised at how slow some of the larger name ministries are to say this. I think part of it is people want to wait and see, and they'll say this differently, I want to wait and see what happens, or I, or I think this is a terrible thing to say, I want to wait and see if it's God. So how are you going to measure that? <laughs> okay, You're going to go to every individual, so maybe it is God for this person right here, and their, their life is being changed, but this person, they're, you know, it, they used it for corruption. I mean, Jesus' ministry was the same way. You know, some people were blessed and saved and healed and delivered. Others said, crucify him. I mean, come on. All right. 
So history is revisiting itself. Now, Linda and I last night went to see the movie Jesus Revolution. Now, I want to be careful what I say. I, I've watched probably every Jesus movie. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's an exaggeration. I've watched a lot of Jesus movies, okay? A lot of them. And back in the day, as corny as they seem now, they were, they were what that day probably needed, okay? So they're always changing. We're getting better at it and, and worse at it. The compromisers get more compromise. <laughs> The, the true blues get more true blue. You get what I'm saying. So we went and watched the movie last night, uh, Jesus Revolution, and it is stunning. I don't often come on and highly recommend that you see something. Hi, Mikey. But I am going to on this one. And uh, there's, the last two that I've done is uh, The Chosen and this. And I do believe, and I'm not going to apologize for saying this, I know I'll get criticism, but I'm going to say it anyway. I do believe they are a work of the Holy Spirit for this generation. Absolutely no doubt in my mind about it. Are there flaws? Yes. Are there things they could have done better? Yes. Are there things they could have done worse? Yes. Does that mean God's in them or not? No. God is in them, okay, and he's using them for his glory. But we do. We do have to discern so on. So anyway, the movie last night, fantastic. Absolutely. I want to watch it again. And what it portrays is the life of basically three or four or five people. So the primary person, persons are Chuck Smith, who is the pastor of Calvary Chapel that exists still today, and Lonnie Frisbee, who was the spark, the young man the, who was a part of the Haight-Ashbury movement, the hippie movement, Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, the statement that he made that was really kind of easy to miss, he said, we did everything like in drugs and everyone. And he was talking about sexuality. Free sex, free drugs, everything was, yeah. So been there, done that. At the end of the movie, I stood up in front of my family and I said, I, I was there. That was my life. I lived through that. So anyway, um, so Chuck Smith, uh, Lonnie Frisbee, and then Greg Laurie, who was the young man who wound up uh, starting his own church with Chuck's help. And uh, so it was really those three guys, their wives, and some, some other people around the uh, peripheral. So when you watch the movie, I don't want to give a, a, you know, a bunch of spoiler alerts, but you're going to see Lonnie Frisbee at his best and at his, well, really not at his worst. They actually were pretty kind about that. Lonnie, Lonnie was used, I feel like, and I don't want to criticize because God forgive, I really, really don't, and that's not my intention at all. But one of the things that I feel like they, they left out is some of the dramatic miracles that God used this skinny little ex-drug addict to do. Lonnie was able to be used by God in some very powerful ways for signs and wonders and miracles. The way they depicted it, it was kind of like they really, they really kind of soft that. And again, I love the movie. No criticism. Thank you for making it, guys. Really, really. This is just my little humble opinion. I feel like they could have done a little bit more because there were genuine miracles that happened. Even uh, Catherine Coleman got her attention, and they showed a little uh, uh, interview of her interviewing Lonnie. And, uh, and again, it kind of had a negative bent to it, which is sad, because really Lonnie was a young man of God, and he was being used by God. You can actually watch that video. I don't have a link for it, but you can Google it and look it up. Catherine Kuhlman interviews Lonnie Frisbee or Lonnie Frisbee interview with Catherine Coleman. Now, as you know, she was the queen of miracles that were happening in her day. And she was very uh, melodramatic, and, you know, everybody makes fun of her, I believe in miracles, they make fun of her and all. But you know what? Let me be made fun of if I'm healing the sick and raising the dead, okay? <laughs> Come on, it's easy to poke fun at people that are doing this stuff when you're not doing it. Anyway, that you can find, the, the black and white interview. On, um, on the internet. So 
Anyway, they kind of downplayed that a little bit, and then, but they also, on the negative side, so that would have been the positive miracle signs and winners on the negative side, they kind of downplayed how deep Lonnie went. Lonnie went pretty deep in sin. He was back. You know, when you're an addict or when you, and it doesn't matter what the addiction is, it can be uh, uh, alcohol, it can be, uh, you know, drugs, psychedelic drugs, uh, it can be psychedelic mushrooms, you know, like I've got written there. I actually did psychedelic mushrooms, and I'm going to go into that in a minute. It can be uh, all kinds of sexual immorality and perversion and so on. Whatever it is that you came out of, the likelihood is if you fall away from the Lord, and you can call it backsliding and falling away, I don't care what you call it. You know, I'm not going to get internal security and all that. The point is you're walking with God and then you're not. All right, so let's just... One of the great things I liked about the film and about the time and about what I see happening right now is the simplicity of simply following Jesus. We make it so complicated. Anyway, whatever sins you came out of, you tend to want to go back. Lonnie did go back into those in a kind of a big way, and they didn't really go into all that. And then he was reconciled, and unfortunately, Lonnie died of AIDS, actually. And uh, so they didn't go into all that. I think it was probably good because they kind of wanted to end on a positive note. The movie wasn't really about Lonnie, and it wasn't really about Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel, and it wasn't really about um, Greg Laurie and Harvest, his Harvest uh, Church ministry. It was about what the Lord, what God did for a whole generation of young people. And I think they did a pretty good job of keeping that in balance. You know, you've you got to have characters, you know, and so on. But really, and I think they would say that too. Chuck would say, it wasn't about me. And Lonnie would say, it wasn't about me, even though at one point it kind of became about Lonnie and he had to, you know, whatever. And this is one of the things, it is a cautionary tale as well. Because, again, this, this has happened so many times with ministers. Once they get to a place, they're, they're well-known and they're making uh, a lot of converts, miracles are happening, money's happening then uh, they can fall prey to what one preacher said, the three, the three G's, the letter G, um, gold, girls, and glory. <laughs> and that's a little sexist because women can fall too. All right. So it really was about the move of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's something I learned that I didn't know. I'll share with you. And a little spoiler, but not, not much. You can plug your ears if you want. So Dallas Jenkins, you probably know that name by now, Dallas, and pray for Dallas, by the way. He, he is in a difficult spot right now, emotionally, and just pray for him. But Dallas Jenkins, the creator of The Chosen, his mom and dad were saved in the Jesus movement. They were called Jesus freaks. Uh, you know, the sign, you'll see it in the movie, One Way Jesus. It was a hand without this. <laughs> A hand, and then underneath it, it said, One Way Jesus. That was like a symbol that captivated an entire generation of young people who were coming out of drugs, out of sex, out of the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll era in the 60s and 70s to the Lord. That became their signal. My brother actually painted that on the side of his car. See, that was our life, and we lived that. Now, the interesting thing is we didn't really know much about that, what was going on, because we were involved in a church that really did not uh, talk very well about a lot of other churches. They just simply didn't. They didn't speak evil of them, but they didn't really speak well of them. And that's a mistake. Okay, We need to embrace what the Lord is doing across the board. If it's demonic, stand up against it. 100%, absolutely. A lot of it is not demonic. It's just not the way you like it. They dress differently, and that's a big message. You know, you've got to understand that God will do things outside of your realm of understanding, uh, your realm of comfort. Now, if it goes into sin, yes, it's wrong. And it's, it's then becomes something the enemy's using. You get what I'm saying. So here's something I didn't know. Law, or, uh, Dallas Jenkins, since mom and dad, got saved. And the one, uh, there was a very, very large convention that happened. If I could ask you guys, please not to message me on Facebook while I'm doing this because the little, the little circle comes up and then it gets in my way. <laughs> Sorry. So, gigantic convention. They say as many as, I don't remember 
uh, honey, maybe you remember this. It was either a quarter million or a half a million people in Dallas, Texas, and that's how Dallas got his name. Okay, Dallas Jenkins, the creator of The Chosen, got his name Dallas. This was his, we listened to his testimony yesterday. Because of this Jesus movement that culminated in 1972 in this gigantic gathering of all of these young people from all over the United States. Okay, now that's a move of God. It's a genuine move of God. Now, I want to talk about psychedelic mushrooms for a minute because I, I feel like part of what needs to uh, be understood is how can God take drug addicts and make them into preachers? And so the Lord spoke a phrase to me this morning that I thought was pretty, uh, pretty awesome. He simply said, yesterday's generation of converts, like we saw in the movie, all these, you know, hundreds of thousands of young people, hundreds of thousands of hippies, okay, drug-induced hippies. Yesterday's generation of converts are today's generation of preachers. I'm one of them. Uh, I have so many friends. Uh, I could name them off. Lanny Pageant's one. I, I won't name them because they may not want to be named. But these are guys that live that. And like I said, I stood up at the end of the movie and pointed my finger at the screen and said, that was my life. Okay, so many people who are in pulpits today and missionaries and evangelists, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were the drug addicts of yesterday. Okay, we have to not write these guys off. I was one of them. Now today they, they aren't, they don't look like hippies, most of them. They're still hippies around, right? But most of them are, they dress differently and they've been raised up in the internet age. And so their minds are proliferated with all kinds of good and bad and super dark things and light, light and dark, all of this information, all of these visual things, and they need the Lord. So what I put here at the, at the title, I kind of flipped that around and I said, Today's addicts, whatever they're addicted to, okay, if they're addicted to the internet, if they're addicted to porn on the internet, if they're addicted to, to uh, some kind of a, a chemical or some kind of a, you know, weed or alcohol or whatever, whatever they're addicted to, today's addicts are tomorrow's preachers. The same way as yesterday's converts that were addicts and so on are today's preachers, today's addicts, today's gen generation, these kids that God, God right now is moving upon across the board. We need to, the worst thing you can do is posture your heart in some kind of a self-righteous, legalistic, I'm standing up for, for righteousness and so none of this is of God. That would be the worst way to posture your heart right now. And I know I'm preaching the choir because most of you if you listen to this program enough, you've already learned how to tolerate my view, okay? But this is so important today. And it's not just important that you nod your head in agreement with it. You need, I believe, my opinion, you need to activate yourself. You need to say, God, please, like blind Bartimaeus. Jesus was there. He knew it was Jesus. He agreed that it was Jesus. Jesus is doing miracles. He agreed with that. Just agreeing with it is not enough. He had to cry out, blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they all shushed him, okay? Hey, let's not go crazy with this. You know, and maybe that's why a lot of people don't want to really get on board. I have, again, I, maybe I'm just missing it. It's very possible. But I haven't heard a lot of, you know, big name preachers really, really say, hey, this is the Lord. This, it's kind of like there's this caution. And I suppose a certain amount of caution is good. I think there have been so many times that people were quick to jump up and go, this is it, the revival that never ends and whatever, whatever, that maybe we're a little bit more careful about. And I think there's some good to that. I don't think we need to jump on every little thing that comes along and say, this is the big thing. And I don't even know if what's happening now is the big thing. All I know is it's happening and I want to see it grow. I saw a map of the different, mostly schools. I saw one in Federal Way, a, uh, I believe it was a, either a high school or a middle school, big, big common area, and they're all praying and crying out to God. I, you know, church, it's happening in churches, it's happening in uh, but a lot of schools, a lot of colleges. This is really the canons of heaven. The canons of God are pointed towards young people right now. Why? Because if this thing is going to go on any length of time, 
we need a whole new generation of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Amen? All right, so, um, oh, the reason I mentioned the psychedelic mushrooms is, and, and again, I'm not just trying to be melodramatic here or whatever, but I heard the Lord say this. One of the things that happens, okay, I just want to be clear about this. And this is not, I don't hear a lot of people talk about this, but I've experienced it. I know some people watching right now have experienced it. It is real. There are gateways to the supernatural. We are meant to experience the supernatural. God invented both the spirit and the natural world, okay? Supernatural is not new age. Just because they hijacked it, okay, that's what the devil always does. God creates stuff, the devil hijacks it. God created angels, angels fell and became demons. It starts out good, it starts out God. The invisible realm, okay, again, you've heard me say this many times, I'll say it one more time. You know, I'll stand up in front of a crowd of people and say, how many believe in the, in the invisible realm? And there's like, it sounds weird to people. So there's like two or three hands raised up. Actually, a lot more hands now than there used to be. Kind of sheepish, you know, they're looking around as somebody's looking at them. And I said, well, how many believe in angels? Everybody raises their hands, okay, except for two or three. It's semantics, okay? It's our, it's our paradigm. It's what we're... It's kind of like if you look through the paradigm that everybody's backslid, all the churches are not good, everybody's messed up, then you're always going to see everything through those glasses. You need to realize God is bigger and better than you and I are, and he's doing a lot of things a lot of places. So a lot of people raise their hand, yes. And so how many believe in the spirit realm? A couple people. How many believe in angels? Everybody. Where do you think angels live? And they're like, oh, the light bulb goes off. Oh, I never thought about the fact that angels are invisible, so they live in the invisible realm. Call it whatever you want. I don't care what you call it. Call it Bugenheimer. It, uh, it doesn't matter. What matters is they are invisible until they're not. Okay, So that means there is a realm that you don't see, and then there's a realm that you do see. Okay, Sometimes we just lose our common sense about this stuff. Anyway. There are two ways to access the supernatural realm, and we are supernatural beings. We're natural. We have a fleshly body. Sorry. We have a fleshly body, and we have a, a, a spirit body, right? Again, you've heard the testimonies many times. You know, if I'm standing there preaching and I fall over dead, uh, <clears throat> everybody hopefully will rush up and CPR and all of that. But my spirit will be there. We've heard this testimony thousands of times. I was in the hospital room. I died. Suddenly my spirit lifted out of my body. I'm looking down. The doctors, everybody's crying. Everybody's, you, you know, you are a spiritual person. Unless it's your, your, your unless, you ha unless all you have is a body, okay, and then you die and Jesus has to raise you up to take you to heaven. No, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That ipso facto means Okay, I am a spirit, I have a soul, I live in a body. Why am I saying all that? Okay, because God was the one that created the unseen, the supernatural, the eternal realm, whatever you want to call it. He created that. There's two ways, okay, there's, there's a lot of ways, but it boils down to two ways that you enter that realm. Two ways, only two. Okay, one is through the devil and one is through God. It's that simple. All the other things that people say are hogwash, okay? Now, there are a lot of ways that apply to God, okay? I believe that you can enter into the spiritual atmosphere of heaven through the Word of God, through worship, through prayer, through testimony, yada, 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 lots of ways, but it comes down to one access point, and that's God. The other one is the enemy, okay? You can access the enemy by saying, by witchcraft, by blasphemy, by anything that has to do with demonic, but ultimately it is the enemy. Drugs, are you listening to me, are one of the ways that you access. Now, I did psychedelic mushrooms. I won't go deep into that. I'm not proud of that. I'm not saying it because, you know, I, I'm saying because I think it's a teaching point. I saw spiritual 
uh, and it wasn't just hallucin hallucinogenic because psychedelic mushrooms are hallucinogens and you can see things that, you're, that are just a product of your mind. But you can also see things in the spirit realm. Now, some people want that enough to go after it. I didn't even know when I went down that road that I was going to access that until the day I did. Okay. And again, I won't mention names, but I know there are people that are watching right now. Part of their testimony is they had done that so many times, so much drugs, go, went through that veil so many times that they started seeing angels and demons with their eyes wide open. Okay, so anyway, what I saw was the devil. What I saw was a manifestation sitting right in front of me, the devil. And I'll, no one will ever convince me what I saw was not 100% real. Now, that was a foolish move for the enemy because what it did is I, I, it showed me who my enemy was. I believe God allowed that to happen in my uh, induced state, my drug-induced state. Now, somebody said, well, doesn't that make drugs good? No, no, okay. If you jump off a cliff and splatter on the ground and you enter... Out of your spirit leaves your body, and suddenly you're da going down to hell, and you all of a sudden realize what a foolish mistake you made, and God decides to have mercy on you and send you back and raise you up. Is it any way possible for you to say it was a good thing that you took? No, God forbid. Okay, God's goodness does not death or uh, necessarily mean what we did, our bad behavior, or good. Okay, so you get that. So I said all that to say. Don't discount people who have gone into the deeper realms of darkness. They are not above the grace of God. They are not above the mercy of God. You, if you are watching this program right now and you think you've gone too far and you say, I've gone too deep, I've done too many things, you're, you're not. You, it, I, and one of the, I have to say this, I, spoiler alert, okay, I have to say the movie last night, one of the people said, it's kind of arrogant to think that your failures are stronger than the grace of God. I like that. It's arrogant to think that your failures are bigger, stronger, more important than the grace of God, the power of God. Nobody's too far gone. If you're sucking breath, okay, unless you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and I think 99.9% .9 of people that are lost have never done that, okay, so don't write them off. Don't write your sons and daughters off. Don't write the drug addict. Don't look at the, the wino in the street, the homeless person, the derelict, the person that they're like a zombie because all they ever do is just stare at their phone all day long. Listen, they're not, they're not too far gone for God. Okay, I was far gone, and I'm here. Lonnie Frisbee was far gone. Chuck Smith was, well, he was a pastor. Lori, oh, what's his name? I always want to forget his name. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Nobody's too far gone. All right? Amen, Tammy. All right, so um, I think I'm going to end with that. That's pretty much what I had today. I just want to encourage you. Again, do whatever you have to do. If you're on the fence about it and you're not sure, go watch the movie. Pay the price, okay? You'll get past it. Sacrifice a cup of coffee. You can do it. Take a friend. Take someone who maybe is on the fence about the Lord. Let them see a part of history. This is not just some, you know, Christian's idea of a made-up story. This actually happened. I know I was there, okay? Not in California, but in Oregon. Now, I want to end by saying one thing about this movie is not going to save your soul. This movie is not going to spark revival. Well, I shouldn't say I don't. Don't look to a movie or a person or a church service. None of those things are the thing. I mean, they're, they're used by God. They're like, I like it this way. They may be a match, but God is the flame. They may be a pitcher, but God is what gets poured out. So go, yes, but go saying, Lord, it's you I want to encounter. It's you I want to learn about. I want to know what you've done in my generation. I want to know what you're doing in this generation because yesterday's converts are today's preachers and today's converts will become tomorrow's preachers. So don't write them off. Amen. All right. Lots more I can say. Uh, I think I put a link 
at the bottom. I do have some scriptures here. Um, I just don't feel like I'm going to read them today. But I put a, a link, the very last trailer that they have made for Jesus Revolution. I encourage you again, watch it and go see it. Take a friend with you and um, just ask God to stir up your soul about what he's doing in the world today and then get on board with it. Pray, go to the meetings. You know what? You can go to one of those, those young people's meetings. You can go to the college meeting. You will not be rejected. Trust me, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's a oneness, there's unity, there's liberty. If the old guy, I plan on finding one to go to. There's, a, there's one in Dallas, I think, and then there's one in, here, right here in Austin. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I want to be in the middle of it. I want to feel it. I want to, I want to receive. God, maybe you're going to do something for me. I, at the very least, want to support it more than just giving mental assent to it and verbal agreement to it. I want more. That's my name. Don't wear it out. God bless you. Love you guys. And as always, give yourself permission to have a great day. Bye-bye.